So why am I here? This is the question that I'm always asked. Why did you come here? And I'll tell you why I come here. Because it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It's not beauty of the kind of a person who loves dramatic topography. I don't care about the mountains sweeping down to the sea. What I care about is farming. And what I'm interested in is farmers and how they handle the land. And I had seen no place in my life where the farmers had more beautifully handled the land than these small fields and modest hills that ran along the Arni. There are a number of reasons really why the biodiversity of this particular area of southwest Fermanagh is unique um, in a Fermanagh context and indeed in a Northern Irish context. Colca Mountain here, which was just behind us, is actually the highest point in the county at 666 metres. When you move from quite low elevations to quite strong elevations, as you can see on this lovely summer's day, we've quite got quite miserly rain um, here as well. So you get all sorts of variations in your climate and in your weather. And once again, that has a hugely strong impact then on the types of plants and on the types of animals that you find. And in this particular area, creating quite a unique and intricate mosaic of lots of different habitat types and therefore lots of different plants and animals. It's really, really rare that you won't actually see in very, very few other places in Northern Ireland, indeed on the island of Ireland as a whole. Tree crop is one of the three tributaries of the Marble Arch cave system. The three rivers that combine here on the upper part of the Marble Bank all come out again at the Marble Arch, flowing through the show cave at Marble Arch. And this is just one of numerous cave systems that are dotted or make their way all the way along Kulka Mountain from East Kulka over near Swanland Bar, all the way over to the Western Marble Bank near Blackland and County Cavan. The traditional source of the River Shannon is a Shannon pot in County Cavan in the west flanks of Kulka Mountain. And that has long been the traditional source because that's a large karst spring where a river miraculously appears from underneath the ground in a circular spring. So that's always been the traditional source of the Shannon, but the hydrogeological or hydrological source of a river is the furthest point that the water originates from. And we know that the original um, point for the River Shannon is the stream that sinks at Pigeon Pot in County Fermanagh on East Colca. So if you go to the source of the stream that sinks at Pigeon Pot, that's the true source of the Shannon because the water that sinks at Pigeon emerges at Shannon Pot. So this is an excellent landscape for cave development, for cave exploration. And one of the most important things about it is that an awful lot of the underground pathways, which have been proved by Dye, have not yet been fully explored and there is a huge amount of cave passage still to be discovered by cavers in this area. So a lot of the new, new discoveries have been made by entrance excavation and digging effectively um, to remove boulders to create a space large enough to get in. And then frequently once you pass that choked constriction the caves tend to open up into much bigger passages that are easier, easier to follow. The great thing about digging is that when you dig into a new passage, you know that you're the first human being who has ever been there. It's exploration in the true sense. And as somebody once said, the highest mountain in the world has been recorded. It's been summited by hundreds of people, but the deepest cave in the world still hasn't been found. land in Mully Mesker near Arney in County Fermanagh and I'm standing by all that remains of a house, a mansion which was described at one time as the finest of its size in Ulster. Nixon Hall. It's beautifully situated. Here we have Belmore Mountain, Quilca, Ben Ochlin, the most beautiful situation. This house 
as we see the remains now, was built in approximately 1793. And uh, interestingly, it was built using stone that was cotted down the lake from Cleanish Island. Behind me you'll see the remains of a stone-built house which has been here on the island since 1922 or 1923. It's one of 11 homes that were provided for ex-servicemen after the First World War. Typically they would have come from a farm labouring background where they wouldn't have had a prospect of owning their own farm. So this was a very attractive uh, prospect for them. The scheme here on Clanish wasn't ultimately a success. The men suffered great hardships in terms of the times that were in it. But as we looked at them as individuals and found out their war experiences, it also became very clear to us that there wasn't one of them who wasn't greatly marked by his experience in the war. For example, the, the man who lived in the house behind me here, he had joined up with four pals all on the same day and he lost all of those, all of the men who joined up with him were killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. They were carrying psychological problems as well. So it's a very poignant story, a very human story. We were able to bring together for the first time the descendants of the men who lived on the island and it was very emotional for them. There's always been this sense, although we didn't know the history in detail, there was this sense that they were built under special circumstances and there was a kind of a sadness about it um, and very much part of the landscape on the island because it is, it is a beautiful place but um, there is this kind of feeling that the, all that history kind of lurks in the air. Community archaeology is key going forward um, in Ireland, certainly in Northern Ireland, because what it gives us is, as archaeologists is connections with people who really know the land, the stories, the history, and where sites are that we just can't know as archaeologists. We really do rely on the public. And though you could maybe say, you know, everywhere is the same, everywhere is important. Um, unless you go to unpack that and work with the community, you really don't know the richness that's there. And we didn't know that about uh, Kulka de Clanish area. You can look at the Arnie and it's going east-west roughly. And there's a, you know, a channel there between Loch McNeen and the Arn. But where we were looking at is north-south as well. It's a crossing point of the Arnie, so it was like a crossroads. And at that crossroads then we became very interested in Clontimo and Fort. And we came up with that theory, could it be a high class, for want of a better word, high status Gaelic site where they were living at? And we decided um, to have a go and it was the community raised the money. The community got the archaeologists in and I helped again in the background. And we found um, a first in Irish archaeology. We found the first Gaelic moated site ever dug, as far as I know now, in Ireland. We've now found evidence, archaeological evidence, stretching from the 17th century. Well, the brickworking as well, stretching from the industrial period right back to the Bronze Age. And all these things we didn't really know about and couldn't have known about apart from working with the uh, community. Myself and Jim Nolan, over the last uh, 25 years, have been looking at boulder monuments, prehistoric walls, prehistoric huts, and rock art. Here we are in Killycane Nature Reserve, looking at a rock art boulder, which has two ring marks and cup within. In the 90s, 
This was the only uh, rock art boulder for the foothills of Quilca Mountain. Uh, since then, myself and Jim Nolan have been able to find up to 200 rock art boulders. About 50 of those would be the cup and ring cup mark uh, boulders, which are the traditional Atlantic rock art. The other 150 would be a form of rock art as yet not known by archaeologists. It's called sculpting. They, they would probably date from Bronze Age. Some archaeologists feel that they may have been late Neolithic. However, it's by context in this area, it is most likely to be uh, Bronze Age. So that people that have never traveled much, they work hard, they're not bored. I mean, what, think about it hard. What right do we have to be bored when people without televisions, without radios, without anything at all could make this little landscape that you inhabit so big as to never bore you? Yes. Every house had its stories. Every lane had a name. Every townland had a name. The names had meanings. They took that little territory and just pumped it up with genius. <laughs> just like a yes, machine yes. and pumped it up and it got bigger and bigger and it got big with history and it got big with fantasy. As soon as someone else is interested in it, then it doesn't just become a memory, it begins to become heritage. Yes. And when it's heritage, it becomes precious. The people who lived along that area for that time discovered that they had a very useful and important material right onto their feet. They hadn't to mine it, they hadn't to dig it. It was simply there, on tour in the sod, and Arnie Clay is sitting looking at you. Uh, I, at the minute, I'm still proving its refractory properties. That is how it behaves in high temperatures and temperatures of excess of 1,000 degrees. But the people then, like they weren't weighing it, they had time on their hands. Their grandfathers had time on their hands, their great-grandfathers and their grandchildren. So the trade was handed down, and as it improved, of course, I'm measuring the tin to add to the copper. These guys just done it. They didn't have to do that. They, they lived with it. That's what they lived for. And I'd say there was a bronze maker, and a bronze maker, that's all he ever done was make bronze, you know. This would have been a very important area for that very reason, because that material was so useful in manufacturing items like guns and swords. In fact, upstream from Arnie here itself, up towards Mullock Dunn, there was a uh, moles for this actual type of sword found on the banks of the river. And not only that, many years later, there was a bronze sword found uh, broken down here at the ford. And this, in fact, is a replica of the exact broken sword. Only I pointed it just to make it into a dagger, to make it, to recycle it. Like that speaks for itself, you don't have to explain how that was done. You can see the pour hole there where the bronze is poured in, right? And uh, it's a great material to work with, you end up with a lovely finish like that there. So all this was all learned many, many years ago and we are now relearning it. So it's a, uh, th th this is what it's all about, like we are wondering how these people made it work. And we're doing it with the brick, and that was in recent times, but now we're doing it with the bronze. So, uh, finding out how useful the clay is, and finding out how useful these people were back in the day. Traditional story about Man and Man is that the man bit, the man comes from uh, the women in Irish, in that that's where they sat, the women sat there and watched the battle of the Fort of the Biscuits. I was never happy with that, and going back through it, I think it might be coming from Mullen Sheban, the hill summit of the other world women, connected with Finn McCool stories, ancient Irish lore. So I was down doing the talk and I threw that out to the audience and this shows you how you need to talk to the community and I threw that out and said, look, does anybody know if I'm sort of right? I'm thinking there must be other weird stories about that hill. And two people, I was so delighted I could have hugged them. I probably did hug them later. Um, two people came back with the story. And it was the same story about this wee old man. I can't remember his name, 
but I think he was called Wee somebody. Apologies if I'm wrong. And he lived near the hill. And what he would do is he would come out his front door, walk around the back of the hill, and disappear. And he would then reappear in the middle of Enniskillen, and I think near Blakes of the Hollow. Although I'm not sure it was there then, but anyway. But what would happen then is when he wanted to go home, he would walk to the same place in Enniskillen, disappear, and appear behind Mullen Man again. And that is just amazing. And I think in that story, you're capturing the otherworldness of that hill, in that these places connected with the she and the other world, you're meant to go into a hill and you can come out anywhere because it's the other world. And I think that's a direct connection now in the 20th century, with probably an Iron Age story that's been there thousands of years. And you never would know that or get that information if you weren't talking to the community. Waters down by the shores of Loch Aran, I met with a beautiful dim. Her voice was so sweet and so pleasing. These beautiful notes she did sing. Oh, the innocent fowl of the forest, their love unto her they did bring. Oh, it been the first time that I met her, my heart did, did jump with surprise. I thought that she could be no mortal, but an angel that fell from the skies. Her hair in resembled gold tresses, her skin was as white as the snow, and her cheeks were as red as the roses that bloom around Loch Erin shore. When I found that my love was eloping, these words unto her I did say, Oh, take me to your habitation, since Cupid has led me astray. Oh, had I the lamp of Aladdin, his rings and his jewels, that's more. I would part with them all for to gain you and live around Loch Erin shore.